You may be seated. Thank you. He's the pastor of the Potter's House. A little church in Texas with 30,000 people in it. Time Magazine put him on the cover and called him the best preacher. He's married to Sarita, and they together have five children. Before her recent untimely death, Whitney Houston was starring in a movie being produced by T.D. Jakes' team. And Pastor T.D. Jakes was speaking at her funeral. We all watched as he was there in his capacity to many people in this country. He is America's pastor. We're delighted to have him on the 700 Club this morning when he talked about his new book. He talked about his new book, Let It Go. He's here today for this special chapel time together. Would you welcome to Virginia Beach, Pastor T.D. Jakes. Thank you so much. God bless you, my brother. Wow. Come on and help me give Jesus a big praise. Yes. What an amazing God we serve, amen. I'm so grateful to the Lord for my space in the building and to have uh, this opportunity to spend just a few moments uh, sharing with you um, out of my heart and uh, out of God's word. And uh, this launches a, a tour for me. I'm, they've got me hitting about 20 to 30 cities over the next few weeks. I keep telling them now I'm too old to run that fast. But uh, nonetheless, I can think of no people that I would rather start uh, my extended speaking tour with than right here uh, in this area in Virginia Beach and here at Regents University. And to have had such an illustrious uh, uh, introduction by Dean Land, I'm just honored and grateful and I'll write you a check when this is over. <laughs> what a blessing it is to be surrounded by so many people that I respect and I certainly want to convey a uh, a happy birthday to Pat. Let's give him a big round of applause. He is somebody that we dearly love and just have the utmost respect for. And uh, this morning I heard him say he was gonna make 100 and I believe if anybody can do it, he's the man for the job. <laughs> Amen, so I'm excited about that and grateful uh, to see Sister Gemini as my friend. What a blessing it is to see you. I'm just honored, just honored. And to all of you, I could just start calling names and, and uh, eating chicken wings and potato salad and just hanging out with my friends today. But uh, I, I better get to work and spend a few minutes. They told me I would be signing afterwards, so I, I better get, get to getting it. I, I want you to look for a few moments at the fifth chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew. And in many ways, uh, this, this text, along with some others, inspires me uh, to challenge people everywhere I go to clear out the debris that contaminates our hearts from being the kinds of people that God really wants us to be. While we outwardly have a veneer of faith and spirituality that certainly passes uh, any optical test that anyone might impose upon us as it relates to the depth of our spirituality. I really don't believe that Christ died on the cross to create uh, a veneer of spirituality, but he is far more concerned about a more intrinsic experience with Christ that is life-changing and creates the metamorphosis of the soul. And when I wrote, let it go, I wrote, let it go so that we could be cleansed not just from the filthiness of the flesh, which is obvious to the eye, but from the contaminants of the heart, 
that can infiltrate the spirit, that can affect how we work with each other, how we get along with each other. Particularly to those of you that are from a workplace and on staff, you spend more waking hours uh, with the people you work with than you do with the people that you love and that are in your family. And so it's very, very important that we develop the ability to let go of the various idiosyncrasies that can contaminate the teamwork and the cohesiveness that makes us effective to explode and to go forward and to think of greater good than our own individual agenda. And if we can get that premise to work and to operate and to be effective and to be functional in a working environment, then why not carry it back home with us amongst those that we love the most? And sometimes the people that we love the most can irritate us to the greatest degree. <laughs> Somebody ought to say amen. amen. I believe it is in, because we have made the greatest investment in them uh, that we are the most frustrated by them. You can't be frustrated where you don't have investment, but when you have a serious investment emotionally and you have poured out your heart and soul with your children or parents or sisters and brothers, and these little contaminants can infiltrate the heart of our relationship, then all of a sudden we can incur the greatest injury where we have uh, implemented the deepest investment. And so uh, I wanted to look at this particular aspect uh, that I talk about uh, in, in the book in some regard. Out of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew, if you will allow me to read just a few verses. And seeing the multitude, he went up in the mountain, and he, when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And he continues down this path. I really want to consider the seventh, eighth, and ninth verse because they are the heart of what we, are, what we traditionally call the Beatitudes. Uh, they, they focus on the intrinsic areas of your peace, of your heart, of being a peacemaker, and it also mentions the word mercy. But allow me, if you will, before I get to the heart of the matter, which is really uh, my subject, if I must have one, is get to the heart of the matter. So touch somebody and say, get to the heart of the matter. That may be what they're hoping I will do today, is get to the heart of the matter. <laughs> But before, before we get to the heart of the matter, if you will indulge me for just a moment, the, the, the preacher in me cannot resist the, tem the, the temptation to illuminate the fact that we see Christ, uh, the Redeemer, the Savior, sitting on a hill. And whenever I see Christ sitting, I see a sermon in his sitting. A sitting Savior, a Savior who humbles himself by lowering himself and becoming before us a symbolism of humility. Whenever, whenever he sits, something is going to happen. Like a judge sitting down and the court is now in session. Whenever he sits on a situation, things will be altered. You will remember the Holy Spirit sat on the earth, and when he sat on the earth, things begin to change and things to be, uh, begin to alter. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what about the woman at the well who came down to the well and found a sitting Savior sitting on a well? A well sitting on top of a well. And there he begins to challenge her to understand that she had been drinking from the well he was sitting on, a contaminant water that would cause her to thirst again. But if she would drink this living water, she would never thirst again. And whenever you see a sitting savior, you see the gospel at its best because it is through the, the humility through which Christ employed that he is able to exalt us so that we might be able to sit in heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. And I just cannot resist the temptation to notice that he sat down to teach them. And then I'll indulge me a little further to talk about the fact that he is sitting on a mountain, the oxymoron between the mountain exalted and the humble savior, that, that the message might be to the disciples that the higher life takes you, the more humble you must become. That if you really have any aspirations of exaltation, any visions of grandeur, any sense of divine purpose whereby you might matriculate to the upper echelon of any society in life, be careful that as you go up in status, in stature, in resources, influence, and integrity, that no matter how high they take you, adjust it by humbling yourself in the presence of the Lord. And then he teaches us amongst all the many, many things that he is, after all, the rabbi himself. He is the master teacher, the master orator. To get to hear Jesus teach must have been absolutely incredible. I can't totally imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus teach. He is the only preacher in history that was able to amass thousands of people to galvanize, to come out and hear him without television, without radio, without a flyer, without a Twitter account, without Facebook, without a business card. Jesus could attract thousands of people to come out and hear him speak. And he would speak so long that they would grow hungry and be willing to faint rather than to miss a word that he said. Whenever Jesus spoke, he would fill a house till there was no more room. And some man so desperate to hear him preach would get four of his buddies to carry him up on the roof and cut a hole down in the roof to get a chance to hear Jesus speak. Whenever Jesus spoke, he could be out in a wind-tossed sea in the middle of a hurricane and preach a sentence like, peace be still. And the wind would be slain and the waves lay prostrate in the floor. What a privilege it is to hear the rabbi speak today. And now he sits on the top of the mountain, able to empty out his knowledge and wisdom. And he steps past the opportunity to address the political mayhem of his generation. He steps past the opportunity to bring equality amongst those who were denied equal rights at that moment. He steps past the opportunity to expound eschatology, and instead he speaks about the nebulous, indescript attitude of a believer. What is it about attitude that took such precedence that of all the things the Ancient of Days could have declared unto us, he chose to speak to us about what it takes to have a blessed attitude, the attitude of champions. The suggestion inferred in the Beatitudes is that your attitude would determine your altitude. So the higher you go up on the mountain, the more humble you must remain in your spirit for his sitting position shows us the position of your attitude and the mountain shows you that if you will adjust your attitude, then God will bring you to the high places of your altitude. So if you are not accomplishing in life what you really want to accomplish, before you blame those around you, check the voice inside of you for that in fact might be, my brothers and sisters, the very heart of the matter. I had several, uh, a couple of years ago, one of my pastors who uh, I walked down the hallway and I saw him and I said, Pastor, you, you, you don't look good to me. He said, oh, Bishop, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just a little tired. I said, Pastor, you need to get some rest. And about three days later, he's in the hospital having open heart surgery. He did not know that 80% of his heart was blocked. How could you work and function and move and not know that 80% of your heart was blocked? How could it be possible that you could live and, and drink and eat and shower and bathe and drive and function with only 20% of your heart getting blood? 
Is it possible that the contaminants enter in so slowly and so gradually that you don't even notice that you are doing more with less? And never really realize that it is the little things, the little attitudes and angers and disappointments and adversities. It is being politically correct on the outside with those that we are disturbed with on the inside. Those little impediments of the soul limit our creativity, stop our functionality, end our cohesiveness. And like my pastor friend, pretty soon we find out that we cannot produce the height of our calling while we have allowed the impediments of life to step into the recesses of our character and our attitude and limit us. So amidst all of the wonderful things that he discusses in the Beatitudes, I have chosen three. And they, these are the three principles I will give you and then send you back to work. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God says, I will give mercy to you when I can get mercy through you. Do not ask me for a mercy for you that you will not extend to those around you. Now let us be clear when we talk about mercy. Mercy is, is, the, is for the benefit, not of the innocent. Innocent people don't need mercy. Innocent people need justice. If I accuse you of a crime and you are innocent, you don't go to the trial hoping for mercy. You go to the trial hoping for justice because when you are innocent, you want justice. But there are some times in life that we are not falsely accused, that what they say about us is not a lie, that what people think about us, we have earned their skepticism and their cynicism. There are some times in life that what they are saying about you is absolutely correct. And when you are guilty, you want mercy. Thank God for Jesus who ripped the veil in the temple from the top to the bottom, way up high where no human hand could touch it. He ripped it from the top to the bottom that we could come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. But read the fine print. You cannot get it if you will not give it. It is easy to forgive the innocent. Anybody can love the pure, but mercy is for the guilty. And though you might not admit it in this lofty, prestigious environment that we find ourselves in today, <laughs> there is not one amongst us who can say you have never been guilty. I know you don't want to mess up your image or I, I don't want to break beneath the veneer of your religiosity, but I challenge you to be honest enough to admit today that if it were not for his mercy, if it were not for his mercy, if it were not for his mercy, you would have been consumed. His mercies are new every morning. The reason his mercies are new every morning is because whatever he used it on yesterday, he can't remember it. It's new every morning. Somebody in this room is living and walking and talking in the mercy of God. You're in this university by the mercy of God. You have this job by the mercy of God. You are married by the mercy of God. You're wearing your clothes by the mercy of God. You drive your car by the mercy of God. You are thankful for things that other people take for granted because you know you don't deserve it. God just gave it to you. It is by his mercy. But my brothers and sisters, we must read the fine print of the mercy contract, which states clearly and specifically in line B, clause three, that if you don't give it, you won't get it. 
So how are you doing on that mercy test? Can you see the very worst in someone and still think the very best of them? Not just when they're innocent, but when they're guilty. When they take credit for your work. <laughs> when you train somebody who became your boss. How you doing on that mercy test? I'm, I'm gonna move on. Touch somebody and say, let it go. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Correlating outer vision with inner purity. That you will see more, no more, of the revelation of who God is or what God has for you. Then you can clear your heart. This is not a pure heart that stays pure. It is a heart that has submitted itself to a catharsis. The, the same word for pure is similar to catharsis, that there is a perpetual cleaning out, an ongoing forgiving, an ongoing release, meaning whatever life throws at me, I'm going to throw it off because the more I can keep my heart pure, the more my eyes will be clear. Oh, if I can get my heart right, I won't have to pray for vision if I can get my heart right. So that means I cannot allow you to get in my heart and shut down my vision. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. There's nothing, there is nothing that you did to me that is so severe that I'm willing to go blind to prove my point to you. Because if I allow what you did to me to get in my heart and I do not let it go, then eventually my eyes will grow dim and like Eli, I will be out of service, not because my eyes don't have the ability to see, but because I have allowed the little things to contaminate my heart until I can't trust my own discernment to determine good from evil, friend from foe, right from wrong, enemy from frenemy, clean my heart so I can know Judas from John. One is sitting on my right side and one is sitting on my left side. One has got his head on my breast and the other one kissed my cheek. I cannot tell which one is which by their behavior. I can only discern them when my eyes are clear and my eyes are not clear when my heart is contaminated. Lord, help me to let it go. Help me to let it go so I can know who to trust and who not to trust and who to talk to and who not to talk to. Help me to let it go so I can know who to marry and who not to marry. Help me to let it go so I can know my frenemies from my friends. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart for they can see. And if you're not seeing, maybe it's the little things that you have not let go that are stopping you from seeing your purpose, your place, and your position in the kingdom of God. And then he says, not only do I want you to be merciful in how you interact with people who have, are guilty and have really rightfully wronged you and you have a right to be angry, but you willingly choose to be merciful though he is guilty and you are right. You do that not because of him, but because of me so that you can receive my mercy, you give my mercy. Not only am I saying to you that you keep your heart pure so that when things come in and they will come in, and there's nothing wrong with little things coming in, but when they stay in and build up plaque, all of a sudden you have a heart attack because too many little things stay too long. Too many images and visions and memories. It's what you're eating that's making your heart sick. A steady diet of rehearsing who hurt you who betrayed you, who lied on you, 
who deceived you. It's what you chew up at night that keeps you up in the middle of the night and makes you have to take pills to go to bed and pills to get up and pills to feel good. If you change your diet, you might be able to clear out your heart. And then he takes it to the third dimension. He says, when you get your heart pure, I want you to make sure in your school, in your office, in your family, that you are the person who is a bridge builder, who is a peacemaker. So when you hear bad news, you don't retweet bad news or forward it or pass it on or inflame potential situations in the office because once you get your heart right, I want you to be an agent of peace in your school, in your family, in your life because if you are in fact a peacemaker, then you are truly a child of God. As I close today, I suggest to you that we can sing all we want to. And we can shout all we please. We can run the aisle and pass out in the floor in the spirit. We can talk in tongues until we sound like the United Nations. <laughs> but if we don't get to the heart of the matter, then we will have to use our faith to anesthetize our pain. And we will use praise as a tranquilizer to numb us from recognizing that our hearts are not pure toward God. And you will find yourself in a predicament that the only time you are truly happy is when you are worshiping God. And that is not because you are so holy, it is because you have a blockage in the heart of the matter. Let it go. As, as I close, I want, to, I want to challenge you to join hands with somebody for just a moment and leave no one untouched. The symbol of our faith is a cross, both a vertical and horizontal line placed together. How can you say you have the vertical and that you love God who you have not seen? If you have aught against your brother, who you see every day. If the enemy can't stop your vertical connection, and he can't because Jesus paid the price for that, then he will do all he can to disrupt your horizontal connection. And it is so strong that when two or three of you are gathered in his name, he promised, I will be in the midst of you. If I have done my job at all well today, maybe something that I have said today will affect how you treat somebody this afternoon or maybe make you make peace with somebody that you've just been politically correct with and, and, and what we call down south, down south, we call it being nice nasty. <laughs> That's country, but you know what I mean. Jesus put a prerequisite on powerful praying and said, if any two or three of you agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done unto you. Touching and agreement is a powerful thing. And so I have you touching your brothers and sisters today because we're gonna be healed horizontally so that we can worship vertically and move into our destiny and accomplish our purpose. The devil's not trying to stop you from making contact with God. He doesn't want you to make contact with the people that you can touch every day. Squeeze that hand you're touching right now. That's where the fight is. That's where the battle is. And so I'll close with prayer that whoever you've been at odds with, whoever you've struggled to understand or get along with, no matter the right or the wrong of it, no matter how guilty they may be and undeserving of your love, 
that you would be gracious to them as God has been gracious to you and let mercy flow through you today. Squeeze that hand and let's close with prayer. Our Father and our God, let your nature and your character flow through us in such a supernatural way that we release the little petty things so that we can go to the top of the mountain. And there, once we arrive at the top of the mountain, humble us so that we can sit there and understand that it is our job to speak mercy even when our spouse, our children, our friends, our co-workers, our fellow students are in fact guilty, we give them mercy. Because everyone standing in here is standing in the infallible mercy of our God. Let that mercy flow through us today in everything we do and say. And if there are contaminants that are getting in our heart, who didn't love us, who didn't raise us, who never supported us, who never stood beside us, who never made us look good at work, who never acknowledged us, if there are any pains that are gathering, even unbeknownst to us, I pray today that by your grace, if you do nothing else for me today, just give me the courage and the faith and the grace to simply let it go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. It's been a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.